I got some. Uh, I've got a friend of mine actually who's been saying to me that she struggles with uh, constant, uh, repetitive, very depressing thoughts and that that has led her to start considering suicide. And uh, I went and looked up the uh, official psychological advice on what you're supposed to do with people when they say they're suicidal. And it was all pretty bland and I was going to repeat some of it here and then I thought, well, I shouldn't just repeat stuff that's bland. The advice I do have is a bit dark, but it's what's worked for me over the years. One piece of advice that I got that really worked for me was from a girl I, one of the first girls I fell in love with when I was at boarding school in, uh, down in Somerset. And there was a girl there who was a, <laughs> she was a hot mess, but I, I really liked her. She would, uh, she was always getting suspended and she was getting fights and stuff all the time. She was a couple of years older than me and she would, she was a self, uh, self harmer. And, uh, we were talking once and um, she said one of the things that had stopped her from killing herself and one reason why she always gave for to other people who, who were, said that they were suicidal was that there are times in life that she'd experienced. I mean, I'm 13 at this point taking the advice from a 16 year old here. Uh, there were times in her life where she had enjoyed something like as cheesy as it sounds, like a sunset. Uh, she was a white girl, but she was uh, from Africa. Um, and she says sometimes when she goes home and she looks out and she gets into nature, uh, Asia, nature, um, she becomes very appreciative of the fact that she didn't kill herself because there are moments in your future that you can't see now that are awesome, but that you'll never get to see if you stop things from occurring now so you effectively are stopping the opportunity for things to get better which sounds ridiculously logical when you say it out loud in a sentence but sometimes that's worth hearing you know however dark things seem now if you kill yourself you're stopping any opportunity for things ever being better and there are beautiful things that could come through in your future but you're effectively stopping that from happening that was one thing another piece of dark advice that helped me over the years i got from uh, from henry rollins um, which was that he chose to not kill himself out of spite, um, out of spite for life, um, out of spite for God, out of spite for the devil. And he said that he decided to be the kind of guy that just kept going for the sake of it when he felt really dark and really down and really depressed. Uh, the kind of person that when he gets out of bed in the morning, the devil says, oh, fuck, not this guy again. I hope I thought by now we would have got rid of him. And he, he still stays, he just keeps going. So that anger and that rage um, can actually keep you going. Um, for myself personally, as, as, as using those things, I just had the idea for a few years of just holding on for the sake of holding on, like a pit bull. And I just be like, no, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna ride this out because if I die, that's definitely not good. Like it's not good right now. I know shit is really fucked up right now, and I can't see a way out of this. But if I die, then I'm never gonna see a way out of it. It's the cutting off of an option. And over the years, another thing that has occurred to me when I'm talking to people um, who suffer with uh, continuous, very depressing thoughts is um, for seeing them for what they are. They're cyclical and they're repetitive and they're robotic. And very often suicidal thoughts, when we have them, if we look at them scientifically and question them, you can kind of see that there is a rigidity to the thinking that locks them in place. Suicidal thinking usually requires a rigidity of thought and a limit of options. The unconscious mind will always choose the most positive um, action given any option or what it thinks is the most positive option and every behavior has a positive intent. With suicidal thinking, you have to reduce your options to, if I stay alive, I continue to be in pain and there's no escape from that pain, but if I die, then that pain stops and there, therefore you turn the suicidal option into what is effectively a logical positive because it's the cessation of suffering, the cessation of suffering. So then you have to sort of get a little bit looser with your thinking and say, okay, well, how do I know that this is true? How do I know that this pain will never stop? How do I know that the suffering will never stop? Is it reasonable for me to think that this pain and this suffering will never stop? And then your brain will fire back with, well, it's always been this way, why would it ever change? And you get down into your beliefs and you say, well, is that a rational belief to have? Does my past 
equal my future? Is the way I've lived up until now, am I doomed to live that way for the rest of my life? Or am I prepared to make changes and to see what happens and to at least give it a go? For the sake of yourself and for the sake of the people around you who would be very hurt if you chose to make that very, very final choice, it might be worth sitting back and saying, hey, you know what, I'll try for a couple of months or three months or six months to maybe get some help, to maybe reach out to somebody and ask for some help, to maybe try and do things a little bit differently, to maybe get some flexibility. And to bear this last thing in mind, your inflexibility of thought around this issue might not be your fault. In fact, it almost certainly isn't your fault. It's probably come about as a result of childhood trauma. What happens with childhood trauma if you are carrying what we call complex PTSD, which is a, a stress response to uh, adverse childhood experiences, and you feel like shit for no reason, and your mind will go, I feel like shit for no reason whatsoever. I feel depressed, I feel like shit, I feel like a horrible, re reprehensible, disgusting, ugly person who deserves to die and I have no value. That those thoughts are not your thoughts. Those thoughts were brainwashed into you when you were a child but you, either you don't remember it or you remember it very, very vaguely and it's not very clear to you. What happens with complex PTSD through childhood trauma, childhood trauma could be neglect or it could be active abuse or it could just be, might be physical abuse, sexual abuse or emotional abuse or just being ignored, is that the thoughts have extra strength. You'll notice that these depressive thoughts that cycle in a very strong steel loop of I'm a piece of shit and I deserve to die, I'm a piece of shit and I deserve to die and that loop seems to be unbrokeable and you can't stop that thought from running in your head. You'll notice it's very emotionally strong and it has a certain emotional flavour. That emotional strength, that emotional intensity is rooted in childhood trauma that you can't see. The flavour, the darkness, the pain, the fear, the suffering and the anxiety that comes with that thought is also rooted in childhood trauma. You didn't put it there. You didn't have a choice. It's not your thought and the emotion that backs it is not your emotion. Now, dealing with these thoughts and dealing with these emotions and taking them away or reducing them, reducing their strength and changing the frequency, turning down the volume and changing the flavor of them is, you can ask my clients, it's um, not easy work, but it's not impossible. It is doable. And you can go from feeling suicidal um, to feeling basically okay or pretty good quite quickly, and when I say quickly, I mean within a matter of weeks, if you're getting the right kind of help, uh, it's moving you in the right direction. But don't give up. Um, you've always got choices, you've always got options, and you should try and exhaust those options. I know that you're in pain, and part of being in pain and adrenalized and feeling like shit is it makes you grip, and it makes you hold on, and it can make us stiffen up, and our thinking can become very rigid, and it becomes repetitive, and you just want that voice to stop. You just want those feelings to stop. So you think that the only way to do that is to terminate your life, but there are other options. Um, and all you have to do is just reach out and ask for some help and try, just give it a go. Maybe, you know, um, you can we can reduce that suffering. Uh, but a lot of that comes down to starting to learn to be um, a little bit kinder with yourself and a bit more gentle with yourself and just coming to an understanding that you are carrying a burden that you did not, you were not, offered it as a choice, it was put into you as a child before you could say no, before you had the boundary or the option to say no, and that's not your fault. Um, so there's a few thoughts on uh, a slightly dark, <laughs> darker approach to suicide. I got a bunch of stuff off the internet that's like, this is what you're supposed to say to people who are suicidal, but it sounded very bland. Um, this is how I tend to think about it. Uh, not that it's something that, that pops up for me anymore, but it has done over the years. Um, for, for most of us who've suffered prolonged inner uh, mental anguish and, and emotional suffering for a long time, inevitably you're going to say, well, how long am I going to put up with this for? Am I going to live the rest, I'm going to live the rest of my life like this? I'm not going to do that. And if I can't stop it by any other means, then this is the way that I would do it. Um, but as I say, if you hold on, and you get some flexibility and you're prepared to ask for help and to be open to making yourself vulnerable and letting somebody else help you and to trying new ways of doing things and of trying new approaches to tackling those problems and to get into the help that you really do need, then maybe you'd see things differently. Okay, that's it. Thank you.